It's 6 o'clock in London. It's 1 p.m. in New York. It's 1 a.m. in Hong Kong, 3 a.m. in Sydney, 10 a.m. in San Francisco, and 10.30 at night in Mumbai. Greetings, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you are in the world. My name is Patrick L. Young. This IPO vid live stream, Series 19, Episode 6 in the aggregate, that makes for 114, starts here. And interesting news from Gift City. You'll remember that's the Gujarat International Zone for Financial Markets, their international financial centre, if you will, created, strangely enough, in the backyard of the Prime Minister, Mr. Moji, Gujarat. Anyway, there are moves afoot to merge the BSE and the NSE, that's the Bombay Stock Exchange and the National Stock Exchange, ruthless competitors at the national level. But they're talking about bringing together their international focused assets and creating one globally focused exchange for foreign investors into the nation of India. Very, very exciting indeed. Meanwhile, over at Binance, well, of course, we've been covering all of that in BitCarnage, our substack, which is devoted to the world of the market structure of crypto and digital assets. There's somewhat of a wide spread here. In fact, this is possibly the bid offer spread of the year because The Wall Street Journal is claiming that Binance has reduced or is reducing its headcount by 1,000 people, while CZ is claiming a mega four FUD, and he's saying that they're still employing yet more people. Only one clear new hire this week, at least that was a new general counsel. They've internally promoted Eleanor Hughes, replacing the recently departed Hong NG. Finally this week, IOSCO dislikes credit-sensitive interest rate benchmarks, which makes life rather tricky for Ameribor futures, particularly as the AFX has just been acquired by a wholly interesting organisation under the suzerainty, of course, Karsten Kengeter, former DB1 chief executive. How well can regulators really see the future is the question I would have to ask. And how much do they just want to close off innovation? I think it's a very worrying moment when central banks, regulators et al. believe that credit sensitive interest rate benchmarks are not a good way forward. Our guest today, ladies and gentlemen, is on the macro. It's fabulous to welcome back an old friend, Hamish McRae. He is... Well, an expert in so many things. The topic is going to be the world in 2050, which coincides beautifully with his latest book. And it's a must read, ladies and gentlemen. Absolutely gripping. Hamish is an acclaimed author. He's a former editor of Euromoney, if I may say so. I think at the heyday of Euromoney, if I if I do say so myself, an adjunct professor at Trinity College Dublin. Hamish McRae is one of Europe's foremost speakers on global future trends in economics, technology, business and society. He's a columnist for the I newspaper and the Mail on Sunday. His books include The World in 2020, Power, Culture and Prosperity, and its sequel that we're going to be discussing today, The World in 2050, How to Think About the Future. Hamish's other books include Capital City, London as a Financial Centre, co-authored with Francis Kerncross, which I have to say I proudly read in my very early days working in the city, which was a few years ago. Amongst Hamish's many awards are the David Watt Prize for Outstanding Political Journalism in 2005, the Business and Finance Journalist of the Year in the 2006 British Press Awards and Communicator of the Year at the 2007 Business Journalist Awards. Hamish, it's lovely to see you. Welcome to IPOVID. Where in the world are you today? Well, I'm uh, in southwest Scotland, um, uh, gazing across a a very, um, very cloudy and murky Irish Sea uh, towards Cumbria, and if you if you go up behind the house, you can see the Isle of Man on a good day. So uh, that's where I am. Mo- more of my life is in London, but uh, as much as I have can is uh, up here in Scotland. How fantastic! So tell us a little bit about yourself, Hamish. I mean, I think probably several of our viewers so far, their intuition might be running towards the idea that you have got some degree of Gallic blood running through your veins. Well, I was, I was, yes, I was uh, sort of the child of a. Uh, of London Scots, actually, as it happened, brought up in the Republic of Ireland, which was uh, why I was just very lucky to go to Trinity College Dublin, where I am now an adjunct professor. And adjunct in quite a bit, if you know what I mean, pretty de- pretty, pretty detached from it, but it's lovely to go over there and, and talk to the students. So, uh, uh, yeah, so, and then, uh, you know, the day job is, is writing about uh, finance in the uh, I newspaper and the City Comet column in the Mail on Sunday. So uh, I keep at it. 
Yes, you certainly managed to keep busy. So tell me, I mean, how did you manage to get into the business of finance and finance journalism in the first place? Well, I, I, I became, I worked on the banker, you know, the venerable banker, then became editor of Euromoney in its early days. And we had a bundle of fun, you know, at that stage. Uh, but then The Guardian came along and I became business editor of The Guardian. Uh, and that had really been my ambition to be the business editor of a national daily. Uh, and I've done it for two. I then did it for The Independent. Um, and when I when they merged the Daily and the Sunday Independent, I sort of wondered, you know, what do I do now? Um, so I became a columnist and then hit on the idea of writing, writing this book about the future of the world economy, the world in 2020. And that sort of changed my life because I then really focused on the future of the world economy. Yes. So, so you made this fascinating move. So that was when the middle of the 1990s, something like that, you wrote The World in 2020? That was right. Yes. Uh, early. I think it, I think I signed off in 93 and it was published in 94, something like that. So, um, yeah. And and there was enough in it. If you write about the future, you're always going to be wrong. I mean, you just hope you'll be sensibly wrong rather than stupidly wrong. Uh, but but there was enough in it of, of in, in terms of bullseyes to encourage me to go ahead uh, and have another whack uh, and encourage the publishers to uh, to give me an advance to do so. And I, I suppose I had three bullseyes. One was Brexit, um, saying that was quite likely. Another was um, seeing that there'd be some kind of of populist revolution in America, um, uh, a revolt against the the established elites. Uh, I didn't mention Trump by name, but essentially it was Trumpism. Uh, and then also I did, fortunately, oh, unfortunately, mention the word pandemic and have a, a half a page on the dangers of a global pandemic. So that was enough in there that, that made me think I could do it again and try and do it better. Uh, and I just, just ought to just quickly say, if you ask me what I got wrong, the biggest miss was managing to write a book in 93 um, 1993, which didn't mention the word internet. So, you know, we, we, we do get some things wrong. Yes, it's very interesting. I mean, writing those sorts of forward books, I mean, I wrote this book, Capital Market Revolution, 1999, which we'll mention later. And actually, it's always amused me because it was way more right than I ever expected it to be. And in fact, I remember my editor at the time saying exactly that. If you can get three things right, everybody will be absolutely happy and it's a huge success. And it's it's incredible how some of the things that you spend hundreds of hours on can seem to be so important at the time yeah. you're researching. And yet they, they really, they head off into irrelevance, yeah, into their own little yeah. B-movie career. And then so other things that you've, you've spent a certain amount of time on and think, yes, that's probably going to be rather important. And they become huge. Well, I think part of the thing that we both do is not just to write about the future, but also to try and... I use the word teach, uh, mm -hmm. teach people how to think about it. Yes. Uh, what can you reasonably, sensibly bolt down that you know? Uh, and what do you acknowledge you cannot know? And then you, make a, you can make a few bets with, in, in that area or in between. Um, so I, I think that, I think that we, we all step back. I, it sounds a bit Californian, but I feel we're all on a journey into the future. We can't get off that journey. So I, I'm a tour guide taking people along, uh, just as you are. Uh, we're tour guides, we take them along, we point out something that we think is interesting. We know that on that tour, there'll always be people who know much more about a particular subject than we do. Mm -hmm. But if we can do something useful to, to corral their thoughts, to make them, make them enjoy the journey, then we've done something that, that's helpful to the world. Yes, and, and I think the point you're making is, it's, it's also very important because it's all about people and storytelling and that's one of the things jumps out at the world in 2050 for me is you talk about a lot of people along the way i mean it's it's not just the hamish mccray pulpit it's not a trumpist ego rant you yeah. bring together all of these fascinating characters who've looked at 2000 years of history if not beyond and then you start telling their story and how they mix into the whole picture and i think that makes it a very very attractive read well i think that you know we, we we stand on the shoulders of giants, you know, <laughs> an awful lot of stuff is written about the future and, and a lot and trying to pick out people who've really done something that changes the way we think we look at it. Um, and we might even talk about, I mean, I talk mentioned two people really. One is um, Angus, uh, Angus Madison, 
uh, an economic historian who wrote about the past, who wrote about the past 2,000 years of uh, economic history. Uh, and the other um, person I, I find really interesting is Jim O'Neill, now Lord O'Neill, who did the BRICS report. Uh, and so, you know, there's just by inventing that clever acronym for Brazil, Russia, India, China, and, and, and pegging it to an economic model, absolutely changed thinking about how India and China in particular uh, becoming much more important to the world. Well, I think you're absolutely right. And, and it is interesting. I mean, what Lord O'Neill did, Jim O'Neill, when he was at Goldman Sachs, he brought about a narrative which is so vital because you think about particularly all these people who are stock analysts and economists yeah. within banks, which he was a, a leading one. I mean, there are so many of them, they're great at managing to do all sorts of wonderfully whizzy things with the spreadsheet, but ye gods, they're absolutely, they're the sort of people that if you're locked in an elevator, you'd want to bring your own oxyacetylene gear to try and weld your way out of it uh, in, in the course of 20 or 30 stories. And it's, it's fascinating how he brought together the whole BRICS thing to the point where even to this day, the BRICS self-propagates yeah. in a way when it's even in a way lost its relevance because really only ek matters right now. Yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. It was technically, it wasn't that good. Uh, it was wrong yes. about a lot of things. <laughs> um, but, but actually the idea that the emerging world is coming to dominate or at least uh, sit alongside uh, and in, uh, the, 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 the developed world is actually such a big idea. Um, so, you know, we, we have a BRICS summit. We have a BRICS development bank now called mm -hmm. the New Development Bank. We, we, have, we, we, have all, we have all sorts of BRICS summit now in, in, that, that uh, Putin may not go to in, in South Africa. I, I think that, that changing the vision of how this world is rebalancing is an extraordinary story. It's the most extra important story of, of our age, actually. It was important mm -hmm. story. And, and he, he found a way of uh, creating an acronym that sold it to the world. Yes, it's fascinating. But then we'll also look at the macro of this BRICS. And that was one thing that I was really struck by when you were talking about the work of mm -hmm. Angus Madison, who uh, mm -hmm. clearly also, by the looks of it, had some degree, I would presume, of, of Gallic parentage, in, uh, parentage in, his, uh, in his background, although I believe he was born in Newcastle-upon-Tyne. But looking at his work going back through 2,000 mm -hmm. years, what struck me over the course of several pages of your book and several charts was that Hold on a second. This idea of the primacy of the UK, Europe, the United States of America, whatever way you want to look at that from sort of, you know, the 1400s on Spain, Portugal, etc. That's a very temporary thing, because actually the people who've always been the largest economies in the world, according to his economic history, seems to have been India and China. Well, the one I love, absolutely. The one I, the one I love is at the time of Christ, um, the world's largest economy was India, the world's second largest uh, was China, and the Roman Empire was a very poor third. <laughs> it, was about, yes. it was about half the size of either of them. And, you know, we, we regard the Roman Empire as, as, as everything that we have got now. We still use their roads, for heaven's sake. Um, but, but actually, it, it wasn't that important in global terms. And um, even, I think, I can't carry the exact date in my head, but I think right through to the 1850s, uh, the world's largest economy, uh, largest two economies were China and, and India. Yes. I mean, it's quite incredible how they managed to propel. And as you say, yes, it is quite funny because that old sort of life of Brian joke actually turns out to be horribly true because if you're Indian and Ch or Chinese, what have the Romans ever done for us? The answer is precisely nothing because they had absolutely no impact on you whatsoever. And I do think that's quite fascinating because it tells us a great deal also about the way that the media and history managed to report things. Clearly, the, uh, the media of, of the, the period around about the birth of Christ being just as relatively limited in many of their thinkings as they are today in different parts of the world, according to national stereotypes and so on. Um, yes. They didn't have social media then. <laughs> yeah, no, that's true. They, they, that's absolutely true. J just imagine live from Golgotha, Golgotha on Twitter. Yes, that's a whole new update to think about. It is a very, very interesting dynamic, and, and it's quite fascinating. So you bring together all of these sources. I'm intrigued to know, do you spend uh, 
all your time reading between your homes in London, Scotland and whatever? Or do you do a lot of traveling and actually get on the road to try and see things as well? I try to do both. Um, I love reading. And I mean, it's a terrible thing to say, but it's actually faster to, to read than it is to um, it is to to meet someone sometimes. So you meet people and you get information from them in a sort of serendipitous way. So some of the things I've found, meetings I've found most exciting have been serendipitous. I was in Istanbul um, and I found myself talking to someone who was heading a large corporation. And he, it was a he, he, um, you know, said to me something that was really quite troubling about how Turkey was developing so five to 10 years ago. And, and I, I hadn't really picked that up. I, I'd seen it as the great booming economy. I hadn't picked up the fact uh, that, that it would be a difficult uh, partner uh, for us uh, to deal with. And it has, so it has proved. Um, so I, that was just a conversation. Uh, I'd given a speech to the company uh, over lunch afterwards. Um, other conversations I find very often from America. I have American relations, and uh, uh, I find my cousins in Montana are uh, sometimes much wiser than uh, bankers in New York. Uh, so, yeah, you know, you, you, you need to talk around and you need to look. And very often, I mean, you, you do this. When you go to a strange city, a city you've only been to a couple of times before, and you look, are the people happy? Uh, are they busy? Mm-hmm. Uh, yep. Are there people sitting around doing not very much? So I, I think that I think that we 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 travel around the world and use our eyes and see stories there, uh, and then we try and tell those. Yes, I, I've been working for years, although it's never really got to fruition, on a book on sort of anecdotal investing by all the things you can spot when you're on the street. And the, the one that strikes me was. Not long before COVID, I was in Beirut, and that was an incredible experience. And people said to me afterwards, what's Beirut like? And I said, well, it's just absolutely the most appallingly, completely, and you can insert any expletive here and get us all banned from YouTube that you can imagine, and you still wouldn't go remotely far enough. And someone said, well, well, give me one example of how bad it is. And I said, well, all the Uber drivers are actually indigenous Beirutis. (laughs) <laughs> and, 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 and I mean, that sounds like a horribly racist thing. Yeah, but actually, yeah. when you look at it, when you go around the world, the people who are striving and on their way up and doing something or side hustling, they're yeah. the people who drive your Ubers. You go to we were in my wife and I were in Boca Raton in Florida for the FIA conference a couple of months ago. We get an Uber. Who's driving it? It's a Russian woman. She's essentially looking for her side hustle. She's getting going. She loves the USA, blah, blah, blah. Mm. And It's not a negative. It's not some terrible thing against Uber drivers. But genuinely, these people were standing there and they were going around the place and they were they were driving it because it's the only job they could possibly imagine getting. And that shows a complete void of what's Mm. going on. And yet at the same time, you go to these magnificent five star hotels and it's like that uh, that French dinner party in in the um, in Apocalypse Now, because there everything is absolutely perfect and beautiful. Once you get through three sets of armed guards and a set of aviation airport hangar AAA grade security, um, mm. and 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 I agree with you. I mean, it's quite fascinating. The the anecdotal stuff you pick up quite often is much better than I don't know. In my experience, going to meet the head of the stock exchange or the central bank or something in terms of what they actually tell you about the economy. No, we, I mean, we use our eyes and you get a feeling for whether an economy is going to do well. I mean, I think that the, the point you make, that immigration is, is a very good indicator of economic uh, future a few months, uh, I mean, a few years out, because mm-hmm. people, go, people vote with their feet to go yes. to places um, that are successful, where, where the, the, which will be a magnet for talent, which will actually welcome them, encourage them, get them to go on and, and, and make money for themselves. And I, I, I do think one of the bull points about America is that uh, it is the great magnet for talent. You yes. look at who's starting those high-tech companies, um, and they are nearly all either immigrants or the sons of immigrants, children of immigrants. 
children. Yes. And, and if you compare that to those of the 1960s and 70s, when, say, Silicon Valley was first kicking off, they were all white, middle-aged, middle-class men, yeah. almost exclusively. And then it was only by the 1980s that you start seeing things slightly changing, although that was still second generations in terms yeah. of the Wozniaks and so on of this world. It's really, really interesting to look at it and, and the different path. And you hit on something there, which you do discuss in the book, mm. and that is the incredible reservoir of talent which is at the epicenter of successful economies like the USA. Mm. Absolutely. Well, I mean, you look at Elon Musk, you know, a South African, uh, transformed the global motor industry. One person did it. It would have happened anyway. It would have got electric, but I guess it happened 20 years earlier than it otherwise would have done. And it's one person. Uh, you know, who seemed who who who, every, who nobody really believed in except for himself, uh, who, who did it. I think it's astounding. He's one of my heroes. Actually, I met him um, mm -hmm. at a dinner in London, uh, and it was difficult. We were one person apart at the, at the dinner table, uh, and it was difficult to have a proper conversation. But I'll say one thing about him: he was profoundly courteous. He was deeply, profoundly courteous, even to the uh, chap who came up with his shoulder and tried to put a screen in front of him and make a pitch to him. So I, I, I you know, I take my hat off to that. That's a, that's so heartening to hear because there are so many instances where we hear of people and they're they're completely odious and there's something really lovely about hearing people are very pleasant, polite, have manners, and are just genuinely nice to all people of all different shapes. And, and and also, I have to say, I'm very glad to hear that he didn't offer to cage wrestle you. So that, that, <laughs> uh, that's another thing I said, probably for the best. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I, mean, I imagine probably in the history of the Mail on Sunday, there may have been the odd columnist who's cage wrestled, but I, I can't imagine it being a very independent kind of thing, certainly. Um, let's say hello here to Peter Sacon. Good evening, all. Hello, Peter. Hello also to Ari. I hope everything is well in your world. If you've got a question, do ping it to Hamish and I as we're chatting away here. It's lovely to see you. Hamish, I'm very interested. You talk about this sort of pool of talent. When mm. you're looking at the world in 2050, do you identify other countries where you see a strong talent pool depth that's going to be powering them forward over the course of the next 30 years? Well, uh, yes. Uh, and I think, and for reasons I don't fully understand, I think it will be very largely the English-speaking world. Um, mm -hmm. The countries where English is either the native language or is widely spoken. So America, yes. Canada, really interesting now, um, scooping the pool, um, really trying to... to, to Australia, uh, New Zealand too, but New Zealand smaller. Australia very much. If you look at where, where, do, where do Chinese and Indian people go to do their university, so very, it, it's the English-speaking world. Now, that doesn't mean that, that countries such as Germany, which is uh, attracting a lot of immigrants, won't do well. Of course it will. Uh, but countries that, that rather turn their backs on immigrants or don't try to, to encourage them, um, I feel, you know, will struggle more. Um, and this isn't just getting young people in because you're becoming very old, your old society. It's actually getting in energetic talent. Um, so I think, I, think, I think the English speaking world, for reasons I don't fully understand, um, seems to have advantages over the non-English speaking world. Yes, that is a fascinating point you raise. And, and actually, isn't it also interesting that uh, in many ways, what was done under the Victorians has had such an impact because all of those Queen's universities that were set up in the middle 19th century across Canada, across mm. Ireland, indeed, at that point in time, although they're now UCs rather than QUs or KUs, and, and indeed, of course, in, in the UK, have made such an impact throughout the world. I noticed actually in the micro that just last week, the South China Morning Post was reporting on how Canada is throwing everything at making it much easier for Hong Kong people who would like to emigrate to go to Canada once again. Because let's face it, the, the Vancouver effect, for, for want of a better yeah. term, that took place there during the course of, well, really the time you were writing the world in 2020 was absolutely marked and quite incredible. Mm. I'm, I'm interested also, I mean, there was a chart. I don't want to get you drawn into the minutiae of statistics, but it was interesting when you were talking about Jim O'Neill and his related stuff. And you also had a chart from HSBC, which was mm -hmm. looking Looking at the whole business, I mean, they were they were analysing stuff in relation to 
how the world was going to go forward and sort of using a mm. Stephen Pinker approach or maybe a Hans Rosling mm. approach or something like that. But I noticed something that was very interesting, which was a 2011-2012 HSBC report. And it says that by 2050, the big mover that I noticed was the Philippines goes from nowhere, currently, what, 35th or 40th or something in the world, to 16th largest economy in the world, which is a spectacular move. Yeah. But it didn't include Poland whatsoever, which I thought was quite fascinating. And this is, by the way, I'm not trying to critique this particular HSBC thing, but it's an interesting it's an interesting trick of the light, if you were, of how everything, when you're snapshotted in time, you can manage to get caught mm. out. Because here we are in this day and age, and I think pretty much every newspaper on what used to be Fleet Street in the UK has remarked recently on the fact that if things go the way they are, the Polish economy is going to be twice the size or going to be larger than the UK economy in the course of the next 10 or 15 years. Yet everybody still has the UK economy as sixth or seventh or eighth in the world on every projection. And they don't seem to mention Poland quite often in these projections. It's funny. I don't know. I can't answer the, the detail on it because um, it was this job was done by Karen Ward, um, who is now, I think, think at Morgan Stanley? I'm not, anyway, I'm quite sure she, 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 it was a really good piece of economic work um, that they then read it later and tried to, you know, change some of their, their assumptions. Um, and yes, it's surprising. Um, big country, countries, big populations will grow very rapidly. Countries, mm -hmm. so Turkey, you know, shoots up sort of around the number 10 level. I can't remember exactly where it yes, is. Yes, yes, um, exactly. Population. I think Poland's population projections are not that large. I think its population may even may even be thought to decline, or, or maybe it was declining then because of outward migration. I, and I, I, think you've hit, I think you hit the nail on the head, actually. It was the arrival of the PIS government who introduced 500 plus, which is essentially an extra children's allowance for every child, which is 500 zloty per month. Not a huge amount of money in first world terms, but quite significant if you're living in Poland. And they have actually started tweaking up the um, the, the birth rate. And the wow. second thing which happened was that their migration wave to the likes of the UK for the European Union has actually impartially reversed. They're actually seeing an influx of people coming that. back, some people coming back. And thirdly, of course, they've just taken in one to three million Ukrainians in the course of the last year. So, that, so the, the point was, I'm not actually trying to critique that piece of work because it's fantastic, but it's amazing how even for a big country, 40 million people, how your demographic future can be upended in the course of just five to seven years of dedicated change, whether you're engineering it as a government or it's just happening around you. Well, absolutely. And of course, the other, the, the reverse could happen. If you're not careful, people bunk out. And, uh, and your best people bunk out, and that's that's not very good either. Um, no, absolutely. Well, I think what's happening in Poland is really, really interesting. Um, and as you say, suddenly getting uh, a million people, some of whom will stay, uh, yep. is just really is just really um, exciting, actually, for Poland. Um, and uh, it, you know, I don't speak Polish. I've been there quite a lot, and I, I love it. <laughs> and uh, I, I love it. And uh, actually. It, you know, know some Polish academics that uh, I've looked at some of their work and it's really good. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's quite fascinating altogether. My, my wife is Polish and she will be back with her live stream at uh, midday Eastern time tomorrow. If you want to watch I for PhD oh, for uh, oh, Women in Technology and uh, she will be she will be around tomorrow. I think that's her last show of the season, actually, before the summer. But you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, it's a fascinating dynamic and certainly bringing in the Ukrainians has been incredible because it's been a huge fillip to mm. where there was previously a stringent George job shortage in things like building because mm -hmm. huge numbers of the builders were all to be found in SW19 and WC2 and other areas mm -hmm. around the south the southeast of England in particular rebuilding the UK for uh, for all sorts of different interesting projects not all of which were on channel 4 or channel 5 but many of them were the the interesting issue to that i think is i suppose i'm 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 trying to grasp towards how do you manage with so much complexity? I mean, there's half a dozen variables that change just for Poland. There are, what, 220 territories in the world, 195, 196 members of the United Nations. And you go and write a book, and in 350 pages or less, of which you've got many footnotes, which are copious and useful, you manage to distill the whole picture of the world in 30 years' time. How do you do that? 
Well, you don't do it as well as you wish you would. Is the <laughs> <honest>. <laughs> you, know, yeah, you do your best, uh, but you know you will be wrong. And I do really mean this passionately. The, the journey is the thing that matters. People are thoughtful and will disagree with what you say. So I hope mostly agree, or at least more than 50% agree. Uh, but, but, but the purpose is to encourage people on how to think. And that's why I, I showed people the workings behind it all with all those footnotes. I, I wanted to show people how I did it so that if they wanted just to read it, then that's great. Please buy more copies. But, but if they wanted then to go behind and look at the, the wires behind, uh, behind it all, then, then they could actually go back to the sources that, that, that I went to and disagree with them or agree with them or, or develop further their own particular areas of interest. Um, and so, as I say, it, it truly is a journey. And I don't think you're credible if you don't admit your own doubts on that journey, the mm -hmm. things that you're, you're worried about, that you may be wrong about, and the things that you, you feel you are perhaps being, you think it'll happen because you hope it'll happen, um, or you are worried it'll happen, and you've covered yourself but you're just hoping 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 you're wrong so as i say i think, I think the process is almost more important uh, than than the uh, than the conclusions so you mentioned a really interesting point of the pr of process because i think a lot of us concern ourselves with hoping that it's going to turn out and all be mm -hmm. lovely and rosy and beautiful but you do have to write some rather tough conclusions mm -hmm. whether you actually want to see them or not it just mm -hmm. may be what you believe in were there any particularly tricky points in this book looking towards 2050? Well, I think there's one mega tricky point, which is um, the environment. Um, we, we don't, we know this is, we know that climate change is troubling. We don't know how troubling, and you can crawl through all the data and it's somewhere between being troubling and very troubling. And I think that was an area where I came out with the conclusion that we would probably realize what we had to do and do it, do it in a fairly organized and cooperative way. But uh, I think I'm worried that I might be wrong. Um, the other thing, I suppose, much other point, is I finish with, with um, ten, 10 great fears, uh, and, and that is one of those fears, um, and then 10 hopes with hopes and, hopes and expectations. But my number three fear uh, actually was that Russia would do something outrageous that would be damaging to both itself and its neighbors. And the, um, the invasion of Ukraine took place just three days before I signed off the final page proofs. Um, and so you, you know how it is when you write a book. If you're, if you're on page, if you're going to take out, uh, yes. if you want to put in 30 words, you have to take out 30 words. So yes. what I was able to do was to slip in saying what may be happening here in Ukraine is actually my, my great fear. Um, but it's just too early to know. Um, yeah. Yeah. In the, in the paperback a year later, in the spring, I had to acknowledge we still don't know. Uh, but, but yes, it, it is clear that this is, that this is something that will be of seminal importance over the next 30 years. Seminal importance over the next 30 years. Now, one thing I'm fascinated by, you mentioned earlier on the sort of sunny hope, optimism, all of those sorts of things. You also talk about a little bit about sort of progressive phobia. Do you find that people do find it difficult to be optimistic about the future? Well, you, you, you know, that if you write anything that is in a newspaper or, uh, uh, you know, in a book uh, that is, is mildly optimistic, you get a wall of torrent of abuse of, you know, you're, you are a lightweight, you know, you're not being realistic. You're, and it, it, if you write something saying something is terrible, you're thoughtful and sage, you know, and, and giving a very useful warning to humankind. Uh, and yet, if you actually look at the way history's turned out, far more often 
the good outnumbers the bad. And uh, if you want a big macro uh, example of that, it is that the proportion of the world's population that is has a middle class lifestyle, and, you know, access to decent health care, access to reasonable education, you know, not, not, not going off on skiing holidays, but having reason, freedom to travel, a reasonable middle class lifestyle. It's now more than half the world's population. Whereas a generation ago is about a third. And I think realistically, in another generation's time, it'll be two thirds. So that's, that's, that's pretty big. Um, I think mean, that is astounding. It's wonderful. Uh, so and I think people tend to ignore that. Um, and there are others, many smaller things that they just tend to ignore. Um, yes. It's that rampant catastrophism. And those of us who were brought up in Britain in the 1960s or 70s, we can well recall that Blue Peter and all these television shows were endlessly running appeals for poor starving devils in the middle oh. of the rest of the world. And you look at pro rat, how many people are fed today, and the population is what twice the size of what it was in our childhood. It's yes, and, li and lifespans are right of 20 years Huge. long. Huge. Huge. Yeah. yeah. Even, no, it, even within the developed world, lifespans are longer. Yes. Yes, Maybe it's, it's, the last few years have been diff difficult, but you know, uh, ignore you know, pandemic apart, they are longer, and we'll yeah. see how quickly we recover from that. Yes, and you made a very good point. I think you were quoting uh, President Obama when he was talking about how this was genuinely the best time in history to be born anywhere, effectively on on the well, planet, which is quite really, incredible. This is really interesting, and people in Britain very often say, "Oh, it would have been better to have been born, uh, you know, in the nineteen fifties or so than it is now." <laughs> But, but if you look globally, the odds of being born in, a, in Britain are very small, you know, 2%. Uh, <laughs> the odds of, if you, if you, if you have, and his point is, if you knew nothing, if you didn't know whether you'd be a boy or a girl, you, you didn't know whether you'd be born into a rich family or a poor one, you didn't know whether you'd be in a developed country or uh, an emerging economy or, 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 or a poor economy, you didn't know whether you'd be in... <laughs> In a peace, in a peaceful society or a war zone, if you knew nothing, what would be the moment you choose to be born? And the answer is now. It is rationally, it is better now than any other stage of human history. And I, I, I cling on to that one um, because uh, even if for some individuals it'll be tougher, uh, in some countries it'll be tougher, for the world as a whole, I, I, I feel this is a source of optimism. Um, and if you then say, well, wait a minute, what about climate change? His answer, and I think it's a very, very moving one, is sure, you young people who, who are so fortunate, that is what you have to fix. Uh, that is going to be the challenge. But you are well educated, better educated than ever before. Uh, and that's your task. Yes. I think it's a very, very apt pointer altogether. Well, I, I mean, permit me to give you a, a second to rest there, Hamish, as you're just filling us with such great ideas. But we have, of course, a book of the week, ladies and gentlemen, that we pick every week. This week, it is not yet Hamish's book. His time will come in September when we will choose to have that. But I do recommend The World in 2050 to be read by everybody here. It's a really, really cracking read. However, let's go back to an earlier guest in the IPO vid series, Dominic Frisby. And he has a fascinating book altogether, which we talked about at the time he was interviewed on the show, Daylight Robbery. Now, Daylight Robbery takes us through the intriguing story about essentially the world of tax. And it's a history of taxation. It sounds as if it could be the world's most boring book. It goes all the way back to ancient Mesopotamia, right up to the present day, and explains the key dynamics of taxation around the world and argues that governments are going to have to radically change who they tax and how they tax them if they succeed in the future. It's a fantastic read, ladies and gentlemen. I thoroughly, thoroughly recommend it. And actually, if you're looking for some other video to watch, feel free to check in to that IPO vid. You can find it on YouTube, LinkedIn, or Facebook, wherever you're watching this this evening. And listen to Dominic Frisby talk about his multifaceted life, including his many excellent books. Thank you, Dominic. Back to Hamish. I mean, looking at the world in 2050, Hamish, we have this, well, it is a fascinating conundrum which mm -hmm. is government and and you write a great deal about it I, I couldn't help but be struck by one two little points one mm -hmm. was 
you talk about democracy and you talk about his democracy waning up to 2050 and so on. And then I thought, well, actually, if we go back to that 2000 year sweep of history, I mean, where, where the Professor Madison was looking at it and so on, well, actually, democracy has only been a footnote in essentially less than 10 percent of that whole history but also the role of government. It, it mm. seems to me that at the moment we have a huge wave of big government and, and intervention. Is that sustainable through 2050? Well, I, it's a very good point. I mean, democracy is very recent. Um, it is, however, an invention that people, people like. Um, people move to countries that are democracies and they move, if they can, away from countries that are autocracies. Um, and uh, so I think that people vote with their feet for democracy. Is it sustainable? Well, we're at a period where a lot, many people have lost faith with it. Um, they feel it's struggling. They feel that the pressures on governments to deliver what they promise uh, and that governments overpromise and underdeliver uh, a bad, a bad strategy in government. Um, <laughs> Uh, and I think there's some justification in that. And actually, I think one of my worries is we will lose faith with democracy. But I, I, I'm reasonably confident that a middle class world will want some form of say uh, in how it's governed. And, and what form that democracy is, you know, uh, I don't think it's for, for us in the West to dictate that parliamentary democracies are the optimal system. I'm not sure they are at all. Um, but some way in which people can get their feelings carried out by government. And it could be a single party state. I, how it's, I think that's, that's almost a detail, that people have their, their feelings, that what they want, they get the government they really want, they get the policies they want, and how they get that is then will be different in countries all over the world. Um, I mean, of course, we get then by saying this into the issue of is the American democracy working very well? Is uh, China working very well? The number two economy in the world um, are squabbling European economies working very well. Uh, and I, but I, I don't know. I, I feel, I think I feel deep down a confidence that democracy will self-correct. It's just hugely messy. Um, that it will self-correct. And I think, by the way, big point here, uh, within China, there is an awful lot of democratic de dem democratic pressure within for uh, governments to do what the people want. That's a very interesting point about how relatively responsive China needs to be in different ways and levels. And I think it's something that doesn't get a lot more press because people just see an autocrat up top and mm. therefore the whole thing is a massive dictatorship. But clearly with that number of population, I mean, anybody over a billion, it's quite difficult to manage to not have some sort of representation, I suppose. Mm. Well, I, I, I had the... I had the pleasure of, of of meeting getting to know a bit and helped organize um a trip around china many years ago so i'm one of the i won't mention his name it's in the it's in the book but one of the sort of top chinese officials we had a dinner i think where we had 70 percent of the deposits of the chinese banking system around around the dinner table wow. um and I, I i took on that point very strongly that the government's the government's legitimacy in, in China was not because it was a party that had run the place for whatever it was, 50 years more, um, 60 years. It, it was because it actually had enabled the country to become prosperous at a speed beyond belief. Uh, yeah. And that was respected by people. And, um, and if the government did not do that, then people would figure out, uh, you know, <laughs> make life very difficult for that government. So I, I, I really believe that the governments that listen to people is, is more important than uh, um, the actual way in which people are elected or not elected. That, by the way, is an argument for constitutional monarchies. 
It's a very good argument for constitutional monarchists, actually. Yes, very, very good indeed. But you make you make a great point because what is it? I mean, Chairman Mao, then you get to Deng Xiaoping, and when they enable reform, you've got something like 80 plus percent of Chinese somewhere around or about or below the poverty line. And now it's like sub 1%. Yeah. And that's happened well, essentially during our working career. Well, one of my great heroes is Deng Xiaoping. Um, and, you know, I... I, I the various sort of family reasons I just got to know a bit about him and and never met him of course uh, but um, but uh, and got to know how they did it the people who advised him and um, and how they realized you should do this slowly you ease up economic controls in a thoughtful orderly way um, and you use the fact that you have an authoritarian government to ease up on the economic side. And they did, therefore, the right way round, whereas arguably, well, I think rightly, uh, poor, uh, poor, uh, poor um, uh, Russia did it the wrong way round. They uh, threw it all open in economics uh, and um, not very well. So, is it, I mean, that's very interesting looking at Russia. And you're right. I mean, Russia imploded and went from, as you were rightly pointing out, I mean, it was the biggest economy in Europe. And then suddenly it was nothing like the biggest economy in Europe as it fragmented in every way. Do you foresee by 2050? I mean, a lot of progress is linear, but in the lateral, are there any massive shocks out there that could occur to existing nation states or supranational groupings? I think the biggest thing, um, and I, I think I've sort of changed my view a bit over the last year since I wrote it or since I signed it off. Um, I think the biggest thing, it, it's in the book, uh, and it's one of the big themes of the book, that China is likely to have some kind of discontinuity, probably in the, in the 2030s, where it moves from being an expansionist power to be to start to look inward and make life more comfortable for its its citizens, and that will be driven by the aging of the Chinese population uh, and by the need to to look after those people uh, and those people's aspirations. They'll be richer than they are now. Will be to have an interesting and comfortable and satisfying life, and it won't be uh, at that stage then to want to go and. And, and, and conquer the world and conquer. Now, I think that there's actually, that I could see. What I've changed my mind about, or, or I think I may have changed my mind about, is the possibility that China will never become the world's largest economy. Mm -hmm. The popular view now is it will pass the United States sometime in the early 2030s, and that's, that may well still be right. But I think by 2050, um, its population will have fallen rather faster than projected even three or four years ago. And we may well find that America re-overtakes China to become the world's largest economy again. Now, this is, it's so speculative, we don't know. Yeah. But I, this is one of the really big issues that will determine and shape the second half of this century, which is whether America remains top dog uh, or um, and China becomes hugely important, more comfortable, uh, probably easier to deal with by the West that that um, and and probably a more useful uh, neighbor for humankind for the rest of humankind. That's very interesting. And you hit on a fascinating point about the United States of America, because certainly it does seem to have that incredible power to bounce back. And, and sitting as I am here today, only an hour and a half away from, from Miami, Florida, it, it's incredibly difficult to believe that this country is somehow or other has peaked or is heading into decline. But one thing which strikes me is you and I, Throughout the course of our entire careers, dating back even earlier than that, there have been voices saying the US dollar has peaked and yeah. the currency of the world is going to change. And I'm just curious, what do you think, looking towards the world in 2050, how the picture of money looks? Ah, well, the, there is a worry, and I think we have to acknowledge it and have to you know, go straight on it. There is a possibility that we will lose fear to money. 
uh, if you say, okay, McRae, what will replace it? I don't know. Um, a basket of, uh, of commodities, um, some other form of claim on, on, human, on the future. I think that won't happen. I think we will retain fiat money. Uh, I don't think we'll go back to gold or commodities, though, though technically it becomes easier with mass information to create some kind of, of money that is a, a basket of commodities uh, and could be traded. Um, but so I think at the end of the day, we, we stick with um, fiat currencies and it will be uh, and do the dollar will remain the most important fiat currency because you ask, well, what can I buy with a dollar? And the answer is uh, an iPhone. Uh, it's <laughs> American services. It is, you know, it is still the biggest economy and it does still produce huge leadership in all sorts of ways. So ultimately what, what is behind the dollar is the American economy and, uh, you know, it's huge. Yes, and, and and in fact, I mean, obviously, since even your paperback came out this year, there's been a huge amount of discussion that suddenly we're going to get a BRICS currency. But I, I don't know about you, I'm struggling with the idea that, you know, the BRICS currency is lovely having a nice gold-backed currency, but then you look at the issuers and you see the political volatility behind them. It's a little difficult to see. I think if my back was to the wall, uh, I wouldn't mind having some gold. I think, you know, I, when, when the gold price, price shot up a... Um, I, I went and had a look in the in the family safe. I knew it had some some sovereigns there. There weren't very many, I'm afraid. Not very, <laughs> no, not, not very good on that, McRae. You didn't do that one well. Um, no, I, I I think that the idea of a BRICS currency is really really interesting. But as you say, who's behind it? And you keep on asking that question. Uh, and I was taught when I was taught my economics in Dublin, it was it was the taxing power of the issuing issuing state um, and the economy behind it, which of course is why sterling um, has declined and is now you know what five percent of of, um, of central bank reserves or four percent of it, something like that. Um, yeah, no, I've, and I think therefore that we will retain fiat currency, but I think that the lesson of the last five years where people felt you could just print li limitless amounts and it wouldn't matter, uh, as will turn out to be one of the really big economic failures uh, of central banking. And actually one of the big lessons that you don't, if you, if you print too much of the stuff, it declines in value. Yes. And of course, last week we saw that Janet Yellen was bowing to the Chinese deputy prime minister shortly after apparently taking magic mushrooms. Presumably the taking of magic mushrooms may well have defined U.S. Treasury policy when she was at the Fed. Who knows? It could be as good an excuse as any for QE. So, so tell me, um, Hamish, this book, The World in 2050, is there one really, really stunning takeaway from it that you think that everybody has to be aware of? My biggest single one, I think, is that... Um, that America and China have a difficult period to get through the next 10 years or so, and they have to get through that cooperating adequ adequately well. And it won't be easy. There will be big issues that come up. It could be military, uh, you know, military action in, in, in the Taiwan Strait. I, I can't predict the detail. Um, but I think that the big issue is if we can get through that, and I think the balance of probability is very strongly that we will, then we can move to a more harmonious world um, through from 2040 onwards and actually start to look at the back end of this century um, with much more hopeful eyes for the planet uh, and for the future of our species. Fascinating. And in fact, we, we had as a, one of our guests, James Falk, the uh, author of Financial Cold War, which is a, a very, very interesting complement to what you have to say on that topic as well, Hamish. So Hamish, it's reached that point in the show where we ask all our guests, where do you, Hamish McRae, think the capital market revolution goes next? Well, I know where I'd like it to go. 
And I, I got a very, I, I'm very sort of old fashioned basics about this. You know, what, what do capital markets do? They collect savings uh, and they then allocate that into investment. Um, and uh, you then look around the world now, where are the savings? Well, half of them are, are in Asia. Huh. So what you need to do, what, what will those savings be used for? They need to be allocated around the world, and savings in Europe and America as well, of course. They've, saving in Africa, really important there. Um, they need to be allocated to decent investments that will give, given the risk profile, the maturity profile of the, of the investors and so on, that actually do produce the investment that the world needs. Um, and it's very basic. There's the money. There's the need. How do we make sure the people who are stumping up the savings are given appropriate products that will then pay for them in their retirement or whatever they want to do? How are the investor, investors, how are the companies wanting to do investment? How will they create uh, the products which will be useful and, and successful for those investors? And, 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 and I think if you go back to that, I think the big revolution will be trying to figure out straightforward mechanisms for creating these things and distributing them. And on that note, ladies and gentlemen, we have looked today towards the world in 2050 with the acclaimed award-winning author Hamish McRae. It's been absolutely a joy to catch up, Hamish. And it is amusing that we always seem to meet in Celtic lands. I do believe it was St Andrews was the last time we were hanging out together a number of years ago. One thing which I will offer as a very interesting piece of anecdotal evidence, I do believe your book has been translated into some form of the Chinese language, Arabic, Japanese and Korean. And mm -hmm. I cannot help but feel that that's certainly a precept towards pointing out a few countries that are very much looking towards their future and therefore maybe nations to be bullish about, although that doesn't mean they're the only people. The World in 2050, ladies and gentlemen, How to Think About the Future by Hamish McRae, absolutely a must read. Get out and get it now. Perfect thing to be reading across your summer holidays. It's hugely thought provoking and fascinating, telling the stories of all sorts of people all around the world. And it's just an epic read. I thoroughly recommend it. That's our show for today, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. We're going to be back next week. We've got another thrilling show coming to you, which we are looking forward to present. And our next guest is going to be, and I'm hopefully going to see a slide on my screen in just a second to tell me. And we've got astrology, the markets and you. How did I not manage to know that that was what was coming up? Obviously, I'm not a financial astrologer like Susan Abbott-Giddle. I'm really looking forward to seeing Susan. We're going to be talking about something really, really different for our final show of the series before we take our well-earned summer break. Now, I'm going to say, well, I hope you enjoy the wonderful balmy weather of the Solvay Firth as you look across towards the Isle of Man or indeed Cumbria during the course of your aperitifs. Hamish McRae, thank you very much for being on the IPO Vid show. This has been episode number 114. My name is Patrick L. Young. Thank you very, very much to our fabulous production team this evening, Herminia, Natalie and Mary. And I wish you all, ladies and gentlemen, a great week in blockchain, life and markets.